This week I had this moment uh, where I was just kicking myself. I pulled up at home and I looked to the right of me as I'm driving and all of my cup holders and next to my cup holders are filled with like empty coffee cups. I don't know if this ever happens to you, but there's like lofty cups and Ironsmith cups. There's just too many accounts, kind of embarrassing. So I'm like, all right, it's time, it's time to clear out the cup holders. So I do what every man does and I determine I'm gonna do this in one trip. And so I just start loading up, you know, my arms with the different coffee cups. And lo and behold, uh, the, I have just one too many coffee cups and it just spills over onto my driver's seat. And it's just kind of gross old coffee covering my driver's seat. And I'm just so bummed that I just tried to like kind of overextend myself and get all these cups in one take. So I go inside, I get a towel and I'm just cleaning up and I'm just wondering, I'm just bummed about the stain it's gonna make and all of a sudden I realize that this car that I've had for 15 years is covered in stains. And that this scenario has played itself out again and again and again, whether it's kids with their Cheerios in the back of the seat, whether it's me taking too many drinks in at the same time, uh, over the years, the upholstery of my car has just been ravaged. And I'm there cleaning it up and I'm looking at these stains and I'm beginning to think about the series that we're in right now on Jesus and emotional health. And I couldn't help but draw the correlation that I wonder if this is how a lot of us see our lives. That over time, the things that we faced, the things that have been done to us, if we take a close look, the stains and, the, and just kind of the wear and the tear on our emotional well-being is visible. But because of that, some of us just don't pay attention to it. And so this is our second week into this new series on emotional health. And in order to go forward in the coming weeks, we have to have an honest conversation. This conversation is about knowing yourself. It's taking an honest look at you. Now, I tend to, when I preach or teach, I tend to kind of avoid this topic because the Western world we live in tends to always focus on the individual. And the Bible speaks such so highly of understanding the world at a communal level. But for the sake of what I believe God wants to do in this series, just for today, for the next few minutes, um, I, I think that maybe it's the fact that we are holding too much in, maybe the fact we're taking a look at the things that are around us. If we could just take an honest look at self. And I know that this is a complicated mess because if you're like me and maybe you grew up in the church, when I hear the, the phrase self, whether that's uh, self-help, whether it's self-control, the self-denial, uh, whenever I think of the phrase self, it, it tends to have almost this negative connotation. And that makes sense. Jesus has these verses. Think about Matthew 16, when Jesus is talking to his disciples and says, if you want to be my disciples, you have to deny yourselves. Um, I think about in John uh, 3.30, when John the Baptist says, he must become greater and I must become less. And so it, it, there tends to be this thing in kind of a lot of our, our minds as followers of Jesus that self is just something to be denied. But then there's this second option that the Bible also talks about how the self is something to be used and displayed. And you think about um, the Sermon on the Mount in chapter five when Jesus says, you're the light of the world. And he talks about, says, in the same way, let this line shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And so the question is, what is it? Are we, is, is our self supposed to be something that we dismiss and deny? Is self something that we're supposed to uh, live into and celebrate? And, and I, I was kind of want to offer you maybe a, a third option. And it's one that the Apostle Paul brings and he, he synchronizes these ideas. 
In Ephesians chapter 4, as he writes this letter to this church in Ephesus, he says this, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This word self is this Greek word anthropos. An anthropos refers to um, your essence, who you are as a human being. And, he, and Paul talks about there's an old self and a new self. And it's when we come to this understanding that we can begin to start not looking at self as something negative that we need to deny, or something that's all positive that we need to celebrate. And we need to understand there's a complexity in here that we need to understand. But we need to understand it. We need to be able to know ourselves, our emotional well-being well enough to understand what is God calling us to step into and what is God asking us to lay down. What is God asking us to think about when we just think about our self, our, our essence, our well-being, who we are, our soul, if you will. And just, just to kind of maybe look at some of the thoughts that some of the master disciples of Jesus have had over the years, I want to give you some quotes. Understanding that this is not, again, some modern take on scripture. This is this is a true thread woven throughout all of church history. Think, take a look at St. Augustine who says this, How can you draw close to God when you are far from your own self? Then he prayed, Grant, Lord, that I may know myself, that I may know thee. Or St. Teresa of Avila says this, Almost all problems in the spiritual life stem from a lack of self-knowledge. Um, or Eckhart, who is the 13th century 13th century Dominican writer says this, no one can know God who does not first know himself. And even John Calvin, uh, the, the great reformer in the 15th century says this, our wisdom consists almost entirely of two parts, the knowledge of God and of ourselves. But as connected together by many ties, it is not so easy to determine which of the two proceeds and gives birth to the other. And so here you, again, you have kind of these spiritual giants and they all come to the same conclusion that if we want to know God, we actually have to take an inward journey to know ourselves. But when we look at the authors of the New Testament, what we find is this isn't as easy as it may seem. And so for us to have a greater understanding of this, I actually want to draw our attention back to the beginning of scripture. Here we have this opening, beautiful, um, explosive scene where God speaks the world into existence. And in its climax on day six, he creates humanity. And as he creates humanity in Genesis chapter one, verses 27 to 29, he says that God created them in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So we're, we're given the initial picture in the Garden of Eden where there's no sin, there's no death, there's no corruption yet in the story. And you have this incredible image where, the, where Adam and Eve, humanity is made in the image of God and they have a job to do. They have purpose and they're to rule and have dominion and we're introduced to this kingdom language. And then as they're there and they're given this creative command, we, we get into the details in chapter two and, and there's this interesting line as chapter two closes and it says this, that Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. This is the concluding verse of the utopian scene of the garden. Think, just think about that. They were fully exposed and felt no shame. Their sense of self was unpolluted. It wasn't complicated. It was able to connect with God. We see him walking in the cool of the day. That was unhindered. There was no, uh, I love what, 
uh, Dr. Tim Mackey says that sin is vandalism against the, against the soul and against the world. And so there's no vandalism yet because of the fall. But then chapter 3 comes and we're introduced to Adam and Eve entering into this conflict. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals and the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say? I just want to stop right there. The, the initial seed of death and sin and corruption came from questioning God's good and beautiful purpose he gave to Adam and Eve that they were fully themselves, fully naked and exposed, feeling no shame. And then this lie comes in and says, hey, do you really think this is as good as it gets? And you know the story and whether you're familiar or unfamiliar with the Bible, there's fruit given, they take the fruit. And in verse 6 it says, When the woman saw the fruit of the tree that was good for food and pleasing to the eye, also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. Listen, listen to their response. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This is the initial response to the corruption of, the, of this now old self, this broken self, is they immediately have this desire of recovering, the immediate entrance of shame. It says, Then the man and, and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees. But the Lord called to the man, Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? And this kickstarts the, the story of scripture, is really the story of humanity, which is a story ultimately of redemption. In the beginning, there was a goodness, there was a beauty, that there was this ability to be fully yourself with no shame, no coverings. And you don't have to live more than a few years of your life until you find yourself wanting to cover up those stains. I'm standing here at a, at a local car wash and, and if you browse the bookstores, what you'll find again and again is self-help this and self-help this. And what they're trying to do is saying, hey, if you do these things, we can clean up some of these spots on your life. But the reality is, and I know having the same car for over 15 years and four kids in those cars, it doesn't matter how much money I spend getting detailed. At some point, the engine and the upholstery and the car will need to be replaced. There's no amount of self-help I can do that can fix myself. And Jesus knew this. So what he did is he came and says, I'm going to give you new life, an opportunity to step into your new self, this gift, which is fully alive. And in a sense, if you will, it's as if Adam and Eve are invited back into the garden. And this is what Jesus is doing. He's restoring us back to our relationship with God. No shame, nothing to hide. So four things as we, as we close to consider the potential is if we let ourselves be known, if we can focus on our self. Four things. Number one, we're invited into grace, growth, goodness, and the gift. So number one, grace. We are free to be fully known and fully loved. I just think about those, those stains in my car and this to be honest, a lot of people I just don't even want to sit in my car because I'm afraid of those stains. But this is what I'd like for you to do. If you're watching this video and you think that somehow you can draw close to God by putting some seat covers over yourself, by working harder and cleaning up your behavior, it's not going to work. So this is the first invitation I think Jesus is offering. Come just as you are. What if you just looked inwardly at yourself and you saw the good and the bad and the ugly you just let it just be there and in fully knowing yourself you have this exposure of wow I, 
I don't know if I'm really proud of these things. There, there is this deep sense that I have wronged people and people have wronged me and there's a brokenness. And it's in this space that Jesus can meet us and extend what the Bible calls grace. If you've never received Jesus Christ, he's not offering you a better version of yourself. He's offering you new life. He's offering you a completely restored relationship with him. And that only comes not through hard work, not through knowing more. It comes through grace. And I would invite you today to receive that. Tim Keller says this, God sees us as we are, loves us as we are, and accepts us as we are. But by his grace, he does not leave us as we are. Which leads us to our second point. When we are willing to look at ourselves, not only do we have the opportunity to receive grace, but we have the opportunity for growth. We can't finish this series if we're not honest with ourselves. I love what James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins. And sin is just an archery term that means you've missed the mark. Confess those things because even when God gives you and Jesus gives you this new self, this new life, we are now in process. And it's in those moments that we can come to those around us, the brothers and sisters, and we can live in an honest way because when we're honest with ourselves, listen to what it says, when you confess your sins to each other, then pray for each other so that you may be healed. Growth can't happen at an emotional level if we're not honest with ourselves. We have to. Have you been following Jesus for 30 seconds or 30 years? We have to be honest with where we're at. And then it's in that place of confession of one to another, confession to God, that not only do we receive forgiveness, but healing begins. In the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at different things like the gift of limits and a genogram and and going back to go forward and all these different tools we're going to have. But listen, those things won't be effective if we're not honest and not willing to grow in that way. Thirdly, Remember that the opening image of a man and a woman, of, of someone itself, is good. A matter of fact, of the day six, it's the one time in this Hebrew poem says that it was very good. Uh, David Benner has this book called The Gift of Being Yourself, and he says this, genuine self-knowledge begins by looking at God and noticing how God is looking at us. I, I just... I just want you to do this exercise. Even now, if you're watching this, unless you're driving, uh, close your eyes. And I want you to imagine the face of God. And if you can imagine that, even if that's a stretch for you, what kind of expression is he making? Now, because of the grace of Jesus Christ, here's what I know. We can look and see our Father looking at us in love but this is has to go back to understanding that when God sees us our true selves the self that Jesus has purchased and is redeeming it's good yourself is not a problem yourself is not a burden yourself is not broken if you are found in Christ what you get to experience is the goodness that God has put in you through his divine dignity, through the cross, that we get to step into this sense when we wake up, not only is God good, but he has called us good. He has made us good. Every single injustice and crime against humanity comes from this place of we don't see the goodness in others and we don't see the goodness in ourselves. And this is the, the the theological principle called the Imago Dei. We have to see that because God is good and he has made us in our image, we have the ability to see and receive the goodness that God has for our self. And fourthly, if we're honest with ourselves, what we will see is that every single one of us is uniquely gifted and wired and built to allow God to do something in and through the world because of our lives. Ephesians 2, 9 through 10 says, for we are God's workmanship or handiwork, the NIV says, but another translation is masterpiece. It's the Greek word poema. You are uniquely built. 
created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Do you know that you have a unique design, unique gifts, a unique wiring right now? So the idea of looking inward is not just to do kind of a deep dive into the things going on in the past. That might be part of it. But when you look inward, one of the questions you should ask is, how has God uniquely gifted and wired me? Again, David Benner says, paradoxically, as we become more and more like Christ, we become more uniquely our own true self. The worst thing you can do is to look at someone else and to let that be an indictment on the true essence of who you are. Rather than when you look at yourself, what do you, what do you find? In the brokenness and the flaws, you find grace. And as you find the grace of Jesus Christ, you're invited into growth. And as you begin to grow in God, what you will see is the goodness of God that is in you. And maturity will welcome you into recognizing your own unique giftedness that God has made you in. And so what is that? How has God designed you? And let that begin to be a compass and a north star that directs your life as you look inward. And again, just to go back to that exercise, would we end this time looking at God, looking at us in love? Kind of my favorite definition of contemplative prayer is looking at God, looking at us in love. What a gift of understanding and knowing yourself. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. God, we thank you that you have uniquely designed each one of us, God, that we don't, that the self is not something just to dismiss or despise, God. It's, there's a beauty in it. And even when we recognize there is an old self, God, I pray that you would help every single one of us step into the new self, put on the new self, like Paul said in Ephesians chapter four. And God, that as we do, I pray for grace for those who've yet to receive this gift of Jesus Christ. God, I pray for growth for every single one of us as we look inward. Lord, I pray that we would recognize the goodness in ourself and the goodness in those around us, especially in this time that can feel divisive. And Lord, I pray that the gifts and the unique wiring that you put in every single person who's listening or watching this would be realized in this moment. Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? God, and we leave this space with a new sense of empowerment from your spirit to walk in the fullness of the new self that you've called us into. In Jesus' name, amen.